I want to thank you so much for your participation and, and, and plead with you to participate further, especially now in the study of God's Word. Um, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to uh, take your word and turn to James. It's somewhere towards the end of the New Testament, okay? So uh, I don't know if you want to start at the back and work your way forward or what have you. I think Hebrews, there's a big book in the New Testament, or Old, New Testament, big book in the New Testament that right after that I believe you'll find James tucked away, okay? Um, I do want to say this. Um, we, we just uh, returned from the elders' retreat. Um, we were gone down to uh, the Windy Hill section of Myrtle Beach. and No, we didn't golf. No, we didn't fish. We did eat. Okay? Man's got to eat. All right? um, but we did seek the Lord. We sought the Lord in prayer. We cried together. We pleaded with the Lord together. Planned. Done some calendaring. Um, I'll go ahead and speak now. There will probably be another big reveal coming up here really, really soon. Uh, about some things that I believe the Lord has led us to be a, a minister to uh, those that are ministering, um, especially in the area of our, of our children's ministry. Um, and, and, and certainly I'm not going to sit here and tell you everything that went on, because I can't tell you everything that went on. Uh, but I do want to say this. Um, me personally, I had a, a Mount Carmel experience, okay? When, uh, when, when Elijah faced the prophets of Baal alone, versus the, the 800 uh, you know, or so prophets, whatever it was. Um, and, and, and God delivered, okay? And of course, one of the things in my life, I, I went down and I, I needed deliverance. I needed to seek the Lord. And, and I went down there with five other godly men that loved me. And, and man, we, we, we created even more community, I do believe, uh, because we see that, that, that each one of those men are in the midst of trial, okay? We're all in the midst of trial, maybe coming out, you know, maybe going in, but, but, but you know, that's where we are. I mean, we just looked and discovered and seen that, that, that God has either had us in a place or, or has us in a place of, of trusting Him, okay, of growing great faith. And, and so with that, uh, you know, we had commonality, we had unity, and man, I just had a great time, wonderful time. You know, I returned home, uh, and, 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 you know, this weekend is set up. I don't have my boys with me. I was in solitude, of which I needed some solitude. I was grateful for that, okay? And then this morning, as I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm further preparing, you know, to, to break up in the Word of, of God, Satan comes. And he comes and says, listen, all that that you've done, that was for nothing because these guys have gone on to their merry lives and they don't really care about you. You know, they're doing their thing. They don't really, you know, they're not interested in you. And you know, this is just another Sunday where you guys play church. You know, he's telling me all this stuff. You know, all these things are coming and boiling up in me. And I begin to pray just like Elijah at his Mount Carmel experience. You know, great success. Defeated Baal in such a great and, and, and mighty way. The Lord delivered him. And then he gets word from a woman Queen Jezebel, that this day I'm going to destroy you. And what does he do? He goes and runs and hides in the mountains and the caves and he sulks and he's sad and he's, Lord, where are you? And I kind of felt that same way. I felt that same way this morning. And I grabbed a few men, grabbed who I could find, you know. Grabbed who I could find because there's godly men in this house. It doesn't have to be an elder. It doesn't have to be a deacon. It doesn't have to be anything. It just has to be a godly man. And I grabbed basically three of the first five I saw. I said, come in here. We need to pray. We need to pray. And we prayed. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling good right now. Okay? I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm thankful for the testimony that I heard of, of, hey, thank you for that prayer. I needed that. We needed that. You know, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say this, that, that I believe, I believe prayer changes things. I believe the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people avails much. Okay? And I believe that for us to be an effectual church in a community what, that needs our effect, not ours, but the Lord's effect through us, we have to be praying people. You know, we have to be, uh, seek the Lord on every occasion. Seek the Lord in, in our lives. Seek the Lord for our family's sake, for our, for our husband's sake, for our wife's sake, for our church's sake, for our community's sake. Seek the Lord and the Lord will respond. He's wanting His people. He's looking for worshipers. And worshipers are those who just, who just cling to Him on every avenue, every facet of their life. And I urge you folks to, to do that. 
always. And let us keep on that firing line and let us, let us show the world and show Satan who it is that we belong to, who it is that we serve. Great faith is going to be required for us from here on out. Okay, from here on out. Well, today we're beginning the second half of this series on, on, on what you have or, or what do you have in your life that requires great faith. It started out as a five-pointer. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and warn you now. It's moved to a six-pointer, all right? All right? Now, those of you that, uh, that, 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 that have an outline, uh, the first three are still in line. You know, we were going to define faith, and we did that. Faith is this, the realization of things hoped for and the confidence of things unseen. Point two is this, is how do you grow faith? Well, here's how you grow. You get into the Word, okay? You read and you study. Or, or as, as um, uh, 2 Peter 1, 5 says, you add knowledge. Adding knowledge. To know God's Word, so to know God and to know His will. Point number three was this that we talked about last time. I said, why do you need to grow great faith? So you can move those mountains, the mountains that need to be moved. So he can take care of your unbelief. And of course, some of you were waiting today for the assurances that faith brings. Well, here's where the new one comes in. It comes in now. Before we get to assurances that faith brings and what makes great faith, we're going to have to tackle another issue. We'll call it point number three A. All right? And before we do that, though, before we do that, I was touched this week by a testimony of, of, a, of a new direction of great faith by one of you all. I've been touched by many of you all. Uh, and many of you all have responded, but this one here in particular responded uh, with a, an email, uh, a novel as she calls it. And, uh, and I'd just like for Marianne to come and share that with us in order for us to, um, to grow our faith. Come on up here, Marianne, so we can see you. My letters are novels when I send them out. And I can't see y'all out there, but I can't read without my glasses on. Um, first, I want to say that uh, through life, um, I think great faith comes in waves. And, and we need that um, at different times in our lives, what we're going through. Um, and every day, something happens in our lives that um, is a surprise. Uh, this morning my family was here. I had no idea they were going to be here. My, my children and my grandchildren and my in-laws, or their in-laws. Um, but God has given me great faith through my life, um, through uh, my daughter that had cancer and, um, uh, and passed. I had great faith then. Um, just uh, he gave me a, a wonderful man to uh, share my life with now and uh, so many wonderful friends and a wonderful church and pastor. And I think that comes from having great faith. But um, I will get to my letter because I can go on and on. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I've really enjoyed Eric's sermons. The last few weeks, his sermons on great faith have been especially interesting to me. When he asks, what is the one great thing, one thing in your life that requires great faith? The safety and well-being of my children is the first thing that came to mind. Their safety does require great faith, and I entrust their safety to God every time they walk out the door. I think that's the only way a parent can have a decent night's sleep and remain sane. Still, when I hear the siren go out at night, I, the fear crosses my mind, and I pray that it's not mine or someone's child that I know. As you know, I have two daughters complete opposites of each other. Most of you don't know that. The older and her husband, which this is a surprise. I added this in last night, and I had no idea they were going to be here. The older and her husband are steadfast in their faith and such an inspiration to me. They have been just leaders to me in my faith. The younger of the two is the one that throws caution to the wind. When I pray for her safety, I also have to ask God to give me the strength to accept whatever comes her way. He has graciously answered my prayers by keeping her safe in those times that I now know were full of imminent danger, and I thank him deeply for her protection, mercy, and grace. Now back to the question, 
And believe me, I've pondered over it a lot over the last few weeks about what um, the one thing in my, my life that requires great faith. I require great faith to have the certainty that my children will know and come, will come to know and love Jesus Christ on a deep and personal level. They will desire to read and, and know his word. They will look to him solely for guidance to survive the world they live in today. They will wait on the Lord to answer their questions about school, spouse, job, where to live, and any other questions they have in their lives. They will share the faith with others. That they will find the peace and strength when they lose family members and friends. But the most important thing is that they put God as the head of their household. Besides, what else could be more important than a personal relationship with God? In reality, I don't understand how a person can live without the assurance that God truly cares about God, God truly cares about us because he is truly our father, and he's my father. Eric's last sermon stirred something in me that I've wondered about for a long time. The fact that I have faith, but I also have doubt. If I have doubt, how can I have faith? This question has, been, has kept me from living and believing what I've heard all my life. I realize now, if I had read and studied the word, I would have really understood I'm human I can have doubt I can ask God to take that doubt away and it's okay he's not going to desert me because of doubt and for that I give him thanks and praise for a long time Satan has had a grip on my youngest daughter's life and tried to strangle her spirit I thought I was helping her but I was using empty words filled with doubt I now have a renewed sense of authority and the words I say are filled with power and intensity because they are words from God. This realization has given me the strength to witness to my daughter, and I thank God for opening her heart to hear the words and to seek them herself in the Bible. There are so many dangers and barriers and evils that stand in the way of a healthy life, and all these things come from Satan. I demand Satan to release his hold on my daughter because she is a wonderful child of God, like all our children. I pray God's love, protection, peace, and strength be poured on her, and she will learn to depend on him for the one thing in her life that requires great faith. Being a parent, as most of you know, is the toughest job in the world. But if we have great faith and passionate prayer, we can overcome anything and instill in our children that the only way to find true happiness is through Jesus Christ our Lord and to have great faith. Amen. 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 Thank you. Appreciate that. I want to thank you for that testimony. Thank you so much for the moving of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to move in us. And, and, and this is um, what she sent to me. I asked her to speak. And, and if any of you have a, a, a special moving of the Holy Spirit in your life that you would like to share, certainly opportunity will be given. Okay? So I just want you to know that. And I appreciate this. And I believe um, adds to what it is that, that we're doing. Great faith changes people. Great faith changes our attitudes as, as we just found out. But I want to say this, that we are now halfway through because God has given me this new point that I believe we need to, to interject right about now. Because you see, here we are in Freedom Church and, and further reiterated in our elders' retreat <clears throat> that we're in a push to grow. I believe that. I believe that from the leadership that we are in, in, in a push to grow, I believe that many of you all are, are, are with me and we're saying we're going to leave this maintenance ministry that we've, we've been carrying on for 18 to 24 months and now we're going to charge the hill. We wanted to charge the hill to be salt and light in a, in a community that needs salt and light. We push to grow. We have, and I, and I urge you to, as, as you can, to go upstairs and see, you know, the, the, the community or the physical plant of, of Freedom Church is growing and expanding. We're, we're, we're doing things to, to create um, 
uh, an opportunity to be greater uh, in ministry here in our community, in our center of the universe, okay? <clears throat> and our push to grow is this, that we have to become people of great faith. But our common enemy, our common enemy, the deceiver Satan, is not going to roll over, okay? He's not going to roll over and allow this to happen. He's not going to allow us to do so without any sort of opposition. If we're thinking that there will be no opposition and that we'll roll into this great move of God without any <clears throat> adversarial trouble, then we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. He, the deceiver, Satan, is going to combat us on every side. On every side, he is going to be, to, to be moving in, as we have already seen evidence of that, and, 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 and we will see more evidence of that. Okay? Now, we do have two choices here. Okay? We have the choice to push forward and trust God and grow our faith, or lay down. Lay down and allow the deceiver to trample us under his feet, and then we have, be of non effect. I don't think that the majority of this congregation, I don't think that the unity of Freedom Church wants that latter one. We want the former one, right? We're looking to make this, this push to grow and to be what God would have us to be, to glorify God and then to, to, uh, to lead others in this, in this place of, of knowing Christ and knowing Him better. But again, Satan is going to combat us from every side. Now, I want to interject this. This gives us yet another reason that you need to know, you must know the promises of an all-authority given God in Scripture. That's who we need to know. That's who we need to rely upon. He is the one that, that, that when we look at the mountain that is in front of us, look over the mountain and see God, okay? There's where our strength comes from the Lord. And so we have to know this all-authoritative God because com Satan is going to combat us on every side. And... His favorite tool that he uses, Marianne, is doubt. That's his favorite tool that he uses to get you off track is doubt. He even tried to get me off track this morning. Okay? And, and, and coming from where I just came from, he's giving me, and he's getting me off track. Okay? So, uh, another confirmation that this passage is certainly very important that we look at it even today. All right? So, looking at this passage that explains a lot on how and why God does what he does to produce great faith and also the opposite and the tool that we as humans allow Satan to use on us Satan to use against us to tear down our great faith and that certainly is doubt the enemy or the opposite of faith is doubt and here's the warning against it if you're taking notes and you want to interject this is point number 3a all right the warning against doubt, and I want to use from James 1, beginning with verse 2. <clears throat> James 1, beginning with verse 2, it says this. My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, or I'm going to use the word mature, that you may be perfect, mature, and complete, lacking nothing. I don't know about you guys, but every situation that I am ever in, if I have a situation where I'm lacking nothing, I'm feeling pretty good about that, okay? You know, I walk into a restaurant, and I got my pockets full of money, meaning I can buy whatever I want to in this restaurant. I am lacking nothing. Okay. Situation upon situation, where I just, I just love that term. Now, I'm going to make you perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse number five. If any of you lacks, if you do lack, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And in verse number six, note the change is the word but. Contrasting, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave in the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And for let that man, or for, excuse me, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man and he is unstable in all his ways. Well, as we look at this, we're going to have to consider these verses 2 through 4. 2 through 4 is a section. And then uh, the, the middle of verse 6 through 9, excuse me, 6 through 8, 
is another section, and then there's a transitioning section in the middle. It's verses five, verse 5 and the beginning of verse number 6. And we'll all look at that as we unpack it, but let's first consider verses 2, 3, and 4. Okay? 2, 3, and 4, we see from the, simply from its address who he's talking to. When he says, my brethren, the Holy Spirit of God is speaking or addressing the church. He's addressing the saved. He's addressing the ones that, 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 that know this, um, this God. Okay? The ones that have knowledge of God. The ones that have been redeemed. So he's addressing the church uh, using the scribe James to get his point across to this, to, to this, this, um, to this group of, of believers. Okay? So my brothers and sisters, my church, Holy Spirit is saying, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it joy when you fall into various trials. Now, our natural bent is not to be so joyful when trouble comes. Amen? Our natural bent is to not to enjoy trial. Okay? Now, and when I look at this word joy, when I look at this word joy, every definition that I've looked at moves us into the place, and it may be that this is just the, the, where we have evolved this word into, but every definition I have found with, uh, for joy equates it with happiness. It uses words to describe joy like happiness. It uses delight. It uses good fortune. It uses success. It uses this word, felicity. And then I had to go look up felicity, which that means happy. Okay? So all of these, you know, every expression or every definition that I found of joy has to do with happiness, delight, success, and the words I just shared with you. I looked, and, and, and as I studied it, you know, theologically now, uh, Charles Stanley, in his... Uh, uh, Holy Spirit Bible study book. I don't even, can't even recall the name of it. He says this. He says that joy is this. To count it all joy when you fall into various trials is joy is this. A deliberate, intelligent appraisal of the situation from God's perspective. That's how we're supposed to look at this. That's what joy is to us is that we are to look at this as a deliberate appraisal of the situation. Now it sounds very technical but a deliberate uh, appraisal of the situation from God's perspective, okay? And, or shall I say this, from a, and how we can look at it from a godly perspective or from a Christ-like perspective. When these trials come, maybe we say, okay, God, what you doing? Okay? Now, when we see that this is, you know, that we are giving this matter over to God, I believe that we can find joy and even the, the happy and delightful and successful joy that, that, that we're talking about here. How does one feel happiness when one is going through various trials? Let's just get down to the meat and potatoes of this issue and, and where we all live it. How can we feel joy when we are going through various trials? The answer is this. The only way that we can do that is to take this verse in the complete context with the next two. Okay? as we take it in complete context with the next two. Because you know what? Here's what the verse says. Pay attention to him. I'm going to reread. I'm going to reread two, three, and four. Okay? It says this. My brethren, count it all joy that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You take the commas out and you take the stuff that's in between the commas and that's what you get. My brothers, my, the, the people of God, count it all joy when you become perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, is that something to be joyful about? Amen. But I'm going to tell you, folks, there's some stops along the way. Okay? Hey, we want the joy, don't we? And we want the completeness. We want to be lacking nothing. But if you want it, if you want to be Christ-like, if you want to see this from God's perspective, we're going to have to stop at the stops along the way. And the stops along the way are these. First of all, verse number three. Verse number three, look. You have to know that the testing of your faith produces what God wants you to have. Okay? Now, there's our word, no. We've... we've, we've We've looked at this thing about great faith and growing great faith, that knowledge has to be involved. Knowledge, I think, is a key to you growing great faith. Knowledge is this, having a full trusting knowledge in Jesus Christ our Savior. We just sang a song. You introduced a song. Knowing Christ, salvation of Jesus Christ, is that enough? 
Is that enough? Is that enough? Amen? Is it enough? Well, let me tell you, some of us don't think it's enough. This thing is really weird. Okay? And seriously, do we think that that is enough? I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is a jealous God, and he wants you bound up in him and him alone. Now, when it is Jesus and something else, we're, we're moving into an arena of, 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 of compromise, and my God does not compromise. Knowing and having full trusting knowledge in Jesus Christ of our Savior, having full confidence in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives within you, is he able to sustain you through various trials? Ask yourself this question. Is the Holy Spirit able to sustain you through various trials? Now, the answer that we have in our head is yes. Is the answer that we have in our heart, is it yes? Is he able to sustain us? Is he able to help us? Is he able to come to us in our time of need? And have this. Have you all the, the, the confidence bound up in God the Father? And the triune Godhead, is that where our faith rests? Or does it rest in what the triune Godhead gives to us? There is a difference. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, as it appears on your screen, is this. It's, a, it's a, one that we've remembered from grade school. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Basically right there it says, here's what you trust in, God. Don't trust in you. Don't trust in yourself. Yourself is going to lead you astray. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. From that we can deduce this. Here's what we need to do, folks. Here's what we need. If we want to grow that great faith, let's do this. Let's trust, acknowledge, and receive. Trusting in the Lord with all that we have. There's our trust. Acknowledging Him. Let us in all your ways acknowledge Him. Whatever is coming your way. Acknowledge that He is doing it. He is allowing it. He knows about it. And then do this. Let Him direct your paths. When He directs your paths. That's what we get to receive. We get to receive the direction of Jesus Christ. We get the direction. Of, or receive the direction of God. For our lives. And it goes this way in order for us to receive completion, perfection, maturity, lacking nothing. Know this, this passage we looked at, particularly in verse number three, that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith, and by the way, faith that is not tested is not much faith, okay? The testing of your faith will make you perfect, will make you mature, make you complete, making you lacking nothing. And that is what you can be joyful in. Okay? Count it all joy when you become a perfect and mature and complete believer. But we have to wait to the end. Or the end of what? We have to wait to the end. Because right now you're in the trial. Some of you are out of the trial. Amen? Some of you are out of the trial. Some of you are fixing to go into the trial, or shall I say opportunity, or circumstance, or whatever. But while you're in it, we have to do this. We have to, to wait it out and see what God is doing. Okay? The end of the process, or the end of it is this. The process of making us perfect and complete has these stops along the way. The first stop in the trial or opportunity or circumstance or persecution or, or, or discipline or something else or whatever it is is this. The first stop is faith. Okay? Count it all joy when various trials come upon you so that it may increase your faith okay as it says this knowing that the testing of your faith produces okay now faith must be tested or proven to see and to see these things now I want you to listen to me very carefully fully completely audience faith must be tested or proven to see this not only if your faith is any good but if it is even there at all It has to be tested to see if it's any good. But it is even tested in this instance that we're talking about here to see if it's even there. To see if it's even there. Now, from that, this message, and especially when we get after verse 5, is going to move into a different tone. Okay? But for us, on this front side of salvation, on this, the one, when he's talking to our, us, the brethren, the, the, the church, faith must be tested to prove and to see so that it might become patient. Okay? Now, patience, better words for this here, uh, you know, um, for, than this translation. And many of your translations probably have the word endurance. 
or perseverance. Okay? Patience is kind of meaning like you're waiting on something. Endurance means you're going through something. While you're waiting, things are happening. While you're waiting, things are happening. Okay? Uh, putting it this way from my, my friend John MacArthur in his study Bible, he says this, Through tests, a Christian will learn to withstand tenaciously. And by the way, I think we're going to need some tenacious Christians here before too long. Okay? I don't know if y'all read the news or saw the news. And y'all said, now, what did you see? What did you see? I see everything every day. I see it downwardly spiraling every day. And for us to stick our head in the sand means to stick our rears in the air. We're not going to do anything any good. We will not be effectual to a people that need the Lord. So, through test, a Christian will withstand tenaciously the pressure of the trial until God removes it at his appointed time. You want to trust in the Lord with all your heart? And lean not on your own understanding? Then we trust Him to remove it at His appointed time. And then MacArthur says this, and even cherish the benefit. The benefit of what? The results? No. The benefit of the trial. For that trial is what has produced in me endurance. That trial is what has produced in me perseverance. That trial... It's what produces patience. All these together make us mature believers, folks. That which God wants us to be. That that God wants us to be. It's the, the mature believer. Now, this mature believer, I want to explain a little bit something about him real quickly. The mature believer is not, and I know it uses the word perfect. Okay? And many of you are sitting here saying, well, I'm not perfect. I don't even know if I'm getting close to this. You know, it's not about sinless perfection. Sinless perfectionism is a false teaching. Amen? Sinless perfectionism on this side by us is a false teaching. Okay? And it's out there. It's out there saying that you can conquer. You know, I can't conquer anything. It is Christ who conquers in me. Okay? It's not about sinless perfection, but it is about being spiritually mature and pleasing to God. God, our God, is the God that recognizes and rewards and blesses effort. Okay? He, and His blessing of effort, creating in us to be the mature believer that He wants us to be, this gives Him glory. This gives Him glory. When we acknowledge that we are submitting our lives to Him, and we're going to do it God's way, okay? Doing God's will God's way according to God's Word, that gives Him glory. And when we give Him glory, when we glorify God, it makes us productive. Friends, I want to be productive. Many of you I know want to be productive. But we've got to get over this fear of, of, of whatever. And the way to get over that fear is to grow great faith. Now, let me move on so we can get done in time here. Verses 5 and 6, the first part of 6. This is the transition verse, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you, this is the verse that's going to separate a lot of us in here, all right? This is the one that's going to separate us from saying, okay, I need to work on my faith and separate to another group of people that in here says, I need to have faith. Okay? And you know who you are because the Holy Spirit will point you out. All right? There's part of you, and I would say the majority of you, will be in the camp that I need to work on my faith. The other part of you, I need faith, for I don't have faith. And let's just listen to me very carefully through this transitional period, okay? Verses 2 through 4 describe what God is doing. There you are, the ones that need to work on your faith. And the response of him is from his people or from his property, from those that are his, okay? Now, verse 6 through 8, or the latter part of verse 6 through 8, describes those that have doubt and therefore no faith, all right? Now, don't get all excited. We'll unpack that a little bit because some of you are saying, well, listen, I've had doubt. Does that mean I don't have faith? No. Remember last Sunday's lesson. Okay? Verse 5 does this. It gives you the offering to avoid the trouble of 6, 7, and 8. Okay? Verse 5, let me read it to you again. It says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. Here we go. Let's start it with the conditional word, if. Okay? 
If but is the largest word in the Bible, then if has got to be the second biggest, okay? All right? If is a conditional statement. If is a conditional statement, all right? If you give me $20, I will be $20 richer, okay? You know, that's just the case. That's it. There is a condition. It's a conditional statement. It says this, if anyone lacks wisdom, if anyone lacks wisdom. Now, what is that? What's wisdom? My group over here knows. They're too scared to tell, but they know what it is, right? Right? Y'all know what it is? I'm not talking about you old ones on the front. I'm talking about those right there, all right? Okay? Because we've been talking about this as we have plowed through chapter 3 of Proverbs, okay? Wisdom, and especially in wisdom literature, and, and wisdom, most of the times you look at for wisdom, it means this. Let's, let's just go ahead and say this. It means salvation, okay? If anyone lacks wisdom, if anyone lacks salvation, and therefore, well, I will say it like John MacArthur says it. He's so smart. He says this. Wisdom is the understanding and practical skill necessary listen to me carefully, necessary to live life to God's glory. All right? It is the, the understanding and practical skill necessary to live life to God's glory. Well, let me tell you, a lost person cannot live to God's glory. All right? They do not. They will live to themselves. They live to the world. They live to Satan. Only the ones who have salvation in Jesus Christ can live to His glory. Amen? Amen? You've got to believe that. You've got to go there. Okay? Now, salvation is in Jesus Christ, or salvation in Jesus Christ alone, is what will cause you to trust God and to be joyous in various trials. God, you are sending it my way. Let me unpack it some way and know that the sovereignty of God has me and that you have this trial, opportunity, circumstance, punishment, discipline, or something else for purpose. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to cope with this and to understand this. Okay? But wisdom means simply this. You need to have the relationship with God through salvation. All right? If any of you lack salvation, if you lack this wisdom, how do you fix it? According to this passage of Scripture, you ask of God. You ask of God. The only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. And I'm saying that to a few of you today who, do, who just doesn't realize that. You're doing it your way. You're doing it your way. You're seeking through the things of this world. You're seeking it through your own ideals. And you just don't have faith. You just don't have wisdom. But how to receive it? Ask of God. Ask of God. And you know, remember your salvation experience, Christian. What did you do? It was something along the lines of this. God, I need your help. I need saving. Will you save me? Well, that's an asking of God. Okay? What do you do when you ask of God? He will give it to you. He'll give to all who ask by faith, believing. He says He will give it to you liberally. Okay? I mean, He doles it out. He just, you know, all that you'll ever need. And the description that we have of God's salvation is this, that it is abundant and that it is eternal. And He says He gives it without reproach. You know, he gives it without reproach, you know, to all who will ask. And many may be sitting in here and sitting in various audiences and sitting in people, you know, these are folks that you've had conversation with, and they say this, that I've gone too far, that God cannot save me. If God doesn't know me, he doesn't know my situation, therefore he cannot save me. God gives it to all without reproach. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you cannot get so far away from God as that he cannot save you? And you know who I'm speaking to. To all who will ask by faith, not holding anything back. And in verse, the first part of verse 6, he says this, let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith, because we teach here at Freedom Church, and we teach the Scripture correctly, that faith is the connecting point. Faith is what we bring to the table, amen? When, we, when the Holy Spirit is convicting us, we by faith, accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and therefore the restoration by God the Father. Those of you who are going to be taking the membership covenant class, you'll hear that today for sure. Faith is our connecting point of grace that Christ saves. God-given faith brings God-supplied salvation and then to all of us Christians brings God-supplied maturity in Him. And there you have it. But let me get to a warning point for a few of you. The warning is this. Verses 6b through 8 
describe the faithless or the doubter. Okay? Very important is that we ask, as verse 6 says, let him ask with faith with no doubting. With no doubting. Now here, remember, the first part of this was talking to the believer. Now we're talking to the lost person. I'm either talking to you who is lost and, and you don't have faith, or I'm giving you all a tool to use for your friends who don't have faith. Okay? So here it is. With no doubting, describes the one who does not go through verse 5. Skip verse 5. Didn't apply verse 5 to their life. This is the person who has no trust in God. Okay? That may, we're going to see as the further description as we unpack verses 6 through 8. Now I want you to note this. Let's, you know, I want you to note here because there is, we've got to carefully understand who we are in Christ and who we are in here without Christ. There's two different groups in here today. Okay? Now, remember what I spoke of last week. This doubting, this doubting is leading a person to not, not to trust God. This doubting that we're describing now in verses 6, 7, and 8. Previously, we have talked about our doubts. Okay? And we used the example of the father of Mark 9. Okay? Now, this is contrasting. This is not, these are two different occasions. So I want to I be clear to you guys. All right? That the, the, the man of Mark 9 or those of us who relate to the man of Mark 9, that was last week. Some of you are sitting here frantically and writing down Mark 9 because you weren't here. And you need to do that. And you need to go back and study the Word of God. See, the man in Mark 9 is the one who brought his demon-possessed son to be healed and was, was not getting anywhere with his disciples. And then he fell to Christ and, 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 and Christ said, him, said to him, said, if you believe, then I can heal your son. And the man says this, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And every one of us as Christians has been at this place. Some of us are at this place. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, this man and you who hold to that statement right there, first of all, what does the man say? Lord, I believe. So we're not talking about a lost person here. We're talking about a believer in Christ. And a believer in Christ who has doubts can go to the Lord and have that doubt rectified, have that doubt ministered to, okay? The one who cries out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, is the one who first believes and then turns to the Lord for help in his unbelief and is joyous when God brings him through the trials. You, you remember the rest of the story? I didn't read it to you. Maybe some of you studied it. But the rest of the story of the man of Mark 9, his son is healed. His son is, is removed, the, the, the possession of the Satan is removed from this man. And as we have said, the man who goes through the trial, through the trial, becomes the perfect and complete believer. Well, we had to go through it in order to get there. Okay? God brings trials and opportunities to correct our unbelief. God brings opportunities and trials to test our faith. God brings us opportunities and trials to produce endurance. God brings opportunities and trials so as to make us mature believers that God wants us to be. But now the warning. Now the warning. Either for you or a tool that you can use as you talk with your lost friend. The doubter. The further description of the doubter is this. He is a person who is like a wave of the sea. Like a wave of the sea. Well, what does that sound like to you? Okay? What are some words that, that, that would use to describe this man if he's like a wave tossed by the sea? I know what, you know, I just come from the beach. Saw a few waves. Studied over it just a little bit, you know. Here's the thing about waves. They appear to be restless. Okay? And the person, the doubter, who does not have a relationship with Christ, he is restless. He is unsettled. 
He's unpredictable. We might think we know where a wave is going until it has swept you out. He is irrational. Waves just do what they want to do. He is like a wave that is, that is of the sea. He is also continues to describe this faithless and this doubter. He is driven and tossed by the wind. Let me look, look, examine your life. You know, what is it that is controlling you? You know, you're, you're, you're like something that is driven and tossed by the wind. You know, you follow whatever the latest and greatest craze is. Whatever the latest drug is. Whatever the latest fad is. Whatever the latest person in my life is. And that's who we follow. And that's who we sell ourselves out to. When God is sitting there to give you the, 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 the peace and the joy that you need. That you're searching for. But yet we go after all this other stuff that is tossed by the wind. As Ephesians 4.14 says it this way. These people are like those that are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men and in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Carried away. And verse number 7, my friends, I believe has to be one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture. As we move ourselves toward, as the doubter, the true doubter, the one, the faithless doubter, moves himself toward, I'm like a, I'm a restless and unsettled and unpredictable like a wave. I am driven and tossed by every wind of doctrine that comes by and by trickery and deceitfulness. And then verse 7 hits us and says this, For let not that person suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Is that not a sad passage of Scripture there? You who are tossed about, and you who follow every other wind of doctrine, don't expect anything from the Lord. The word for is, is appears again as a conditional word implying this, that certain conditions are offered. Certain conditions are offered, but it is up to the receiver to accept or reject the offer. And my plea is to you today, don't reject the offer. Don't reject the offer of salvation. See, the doubter of God rejects this condition. The doubter says it's not true. The doubter doesn't know what truth is. But he still rejects this. The doubter of God rejects this condition and will not receive the salvation or anything, for that matter, from the Lord. So says verse 7. Funny thing is this. If you don't receive God's salvation when offered, does anything else ever really matter? And if it doesn't matter, then I would say that the salvation of the Lord is everything that we need. Verse number 8 concludes and it says, this person has become double-minded. So let me give you a warning as well. And this is, you know, for every one of us, for all of us. He becomes double-minded. Double-minded kind of means this. He's divided. And division never stands. Division never stands for anything. Okay? He's divided over his love of self. Well, I'm okay. I'm all right. Well, I'm going to tell you, you don't, you know, it's, it's not up to you. He's, he's, he's fine with the world. He's fine with his sin. He's fine with Satan. And the funny thing is, he's fine with God. God's not going to send me to hell, the argument that I hear most of the time. You're right. He's not. You're going to make the choice to go on your own. And you will relive that in hell for all of eternity. That's the hell of hell. For you to choose, double-minded person, for you to choose all of these, I'm going to hang out with myself for a while. I'm going to deal with sin for a while. I'm going to go with the world because of its ease and comfort. I'm going to go and do whatever I want to do. Oh, yeah, and Sunday I'm going to show up for God. Yeah, I'll do that, you know. I'm going to tell you this, for you to make that choice, for you to make that choice, for you to choose all of them is to not choose God. Okay? Because God does not compromise. I said that at the beginning. God is a jealous God. Meaning this, it is all in or all out. That's the way He works. Okay? That's the way He works. If you do not receive God's salvation, if you do not choose that alone 
You choose them off, that's double-mindedness, and he doesn't go with that. He doesn't go with division. He doesn't live in that realm. So you're either all in with him or all out. He shares his glory with no one or no thing. So I think each of us has some things to, to hammer out here. Okay? And as I'm closing, as an invitation time is coming, and Dave and his company is going to come to, to, to share with us, some of you are even asking this. Well, preacher, why this additional point? You didn't tell us Christians how to battle against doubt. Oh, yes, I did. If you didn't get it, you weren't listening. If you didn't get it, you weren't listening last week. Well, I wasn't here last week. Hey, it's on YouTube. Isn't it, Jerry? It's on YouTube. It is. I ain't lying. And it'll be on there some more. My answer is this. I told you Christians how to battle against doubt last week. Lord, I believe. You help my unbelief. Everything that I have is sown up in you, Jesus Christ. Now today, some of you, some of you all need to inspect your own lives to see which side of verse 5 you're living on. Some of you maybe even for the first time in here found out the truth that there is the side of Christ, and there's the side of self, Satan, this world, of double-mindedness, of, of tossing to and fro, of lostness. But the majesty and grace of Jesus Christ is that verse 5 is provided in there for all of us. If any of you lacks salvation, let him ask of God, who gives it liberally and without reproach. It's here for the taking. It's here for your asking. Are you joyous because God has chosen a trial for you, Christian? You know, He's chosen this trial for you so as to grow your faith. And your faith is what matters. Your endurance to become a mature believer. He wants you, He wants you to be and to trust in Him in all of that. Or are you in here and you have no foundational faith so that you doubt and that you're tossed, you're led astray with no gift from the Lord and therefore you are branded this, unstable. We call them lost. Christian, I believe there is something in here for you. I believe that this message is for you. Now, I believe that not because I, I'm convinced of it, but because Holy Spirit said it. He's the one that put it in. He's the one that put a, a lesson for us Christians and a lesson for the lost. He's the one who put them together, and he put them together for a reason. These two points are in the same context, so as to show us, show us the church of Jesus Christ how serious it is, and how serious the nature of growing and becoming people of great faith must be in this time and in all time. Satan is out there roaming to and fro, battling for your heart, battling for your soul to out to destroy you and your loved ones. Let me pose the question to you, church. Do you want to become people of great faith? It will more than likely come through various trials. You ready? Are all of you ready? Now's the time for an invitation. Now's the time for an invitation. And I plead with you, if you don't have this faith that I've been talking about, today is the day of salvation. If you have this faith and it needs to be corrected and worked upon, the list has been given to you. Grow that faith. Commune with God. Get into His Word. And become the mature believer that God has for you. Because when that trial comes, I want you to depend on the sovereignty of God and not the sovereignty of man or this preacher or even this church. The sovereignty of God. Stand with me. The invitation time is yours, and I trust that you will use it to your advantage this day. Come today.